One of the most entertaining things to watch play out in wrestling is the relationship between a good wrestler and manager double act. Really, it's been a staple of the industry for so many decades now. But what are the best of the best when it comes to these pairings? Well, that's exactly what we're going to be looking at today. So join us as we take a deep dive into advocates and clients, the greatest manager and wrestler pairings. And if we're going to start anywhere, why not do so by going all the way back to the territories, the time period many people still consider to be the peak of the manager, as it was then that Jim Cornette was helping the Midnight Express to reach heights they could have never dreamed of otherwise. Yes, before he was known for his podcast, Corny was arguably the best manager in the business. And this was something he proved all throughout the 80s as he stood by Stan Lane and Bobby Eaton's side during their countless tag team wars across places such as Mid-South Wrestling, World Class Championship Wrestling, and Jim Crockett Promotions. Sure, the pair were more than capable of getting by without him, as shown by the fact that they won tag team gold pretty much everywhere they went. But it didn't exactly hurt their case that whenever there was a promo needing to be cut, Jim was right there to draw everyone in with his spoiled rich kid heel character, making everyone desperate to see him and his boys get beaten up in the process. Hell, this was a large part of the reason their feud with the Rock and Roll Express was as legendary as it was. And it's also a big factor in why the team is still considered one of the greatest of all time to this day. But unfortunately, it doesn't look as though we'll be seeing the two surviving members, Cornette and Lane, come back together in the ring anytime soon, as with the former now pretty much retired from wrestling outside of doing his podcast, and the latter seemingly happy to disappear from the spotlight altogether, the days of the Midnight Express appear to be over for good. But then maybe that's a good thing, because as the terrible attempt to reboot the act under Cornette's managership as the new Midnight Express in late 90s WWF shows, some things are best left in the past. And that's certainly a point which could also be applied to our next subject too, because while they may have had a few highs during the Attitude Era, the real peak of the Road Warriors came during their 80s run when they were being managed by Paul Ellering. That's right, back during the era of the Territories, there was arguably no one in the entire industry moreover than Hawk and Animal. And this is why the term Road Warrior Pop had to be specifically created to describe the insane reaction they'd get every time they came through the curtain for a match. And of course, whenever they did this, they'd always have their advocate by their side, the man making the plays for them and keeping them at the top of their game, Paul Ellering. Honestly, when we say Ellering was managing the Road Warriors, that's a shoot, because he was the guy helping them to get bookings and making sure they were getting paid behind the scenes. So not having to worry about any of that then, it meant Hawk and Animal were free to focus all of their attention on kicking ass in the ring in the way only they could. Looking for someone who's going to sell your moves? then you're looking in the wrong place, because this team didn't sell for anyone. No, all they did was beat people up and get more over for doing so. And once they were done with that, it was back to the hotel bar where Ellering would get the drinks in and make sure each man was ready to go to war again the following evening. It didn't matter if it was Georgia Championship Wrestling, the AWA, Jim Crockett Promotions, WWF, or even Japan. No one went harder than the team which stands today as arguably the greatest of all time. And that's exactly why they're so decorated, with them winning tag team gold in pretty much all of the aforementioned promotions. Would they have been as successful without their manager by their side? It's possible, but it's unlikely as given how wild the two were back in the 80s, there was always going to be someone required to corral them in and stop them from becoming their own worst enemies. And Paul Ellering wasn't the only man serving as a legitimate manager behind the scenes for the team he was with on screen either. No, well, he was keeping Hawk and Animal in check. Over in Jim Crockett Promotions, J.J. Dillon was doing the same for the Four Horsemen. Now, we don't have to tell you who the Four Horsemen are, as they are probably the most famous stable in all of wrestling. Hell, really, they were the industry's first ever supergroup on account of the fact that they were initially made up of four bona fide top level acts in Ric Flair, Tully Blanchard, Arn Anderson, and Ole Anderson. Of course, as the years went on, though, various members would come and go, with the likes of Barry Windham, Lex Luger, and even Sting joining up with the group at points. But one thing which always remained a constant, at least during their peak years, was that J.J. Dillon would be there in their corner, making sure they got everything they needed. And as we mentioned a moment ago, this also extended to their life outside the ring too, because after a hard-fought battle each night, all four members of the Horsemen were notorious for partying hard. So this meant Dylan had to ensure the drinks were always flowing and the private jets were always waiting for them whenever they decided to pick up and go. 
But it wasn't all partying after the fact. No, when it came time for the bell to ring, everyone involved took their work very seriously, and that included their manager too, as he was always there at ringside to offer some much needed advice. Either that, or he was preparing himself for a promo segment later on in the evening where he'd be required to help get his clients over. That's right, arguably the biggest part of being a manager is serving as a mouthpiece for someone who perhaps isn't the best talker. And in the modern day, there are few better examples of this in action than with the all-time great pairing that was Paul Heyman and Brock Lesnar. Now sure, you could argue the Beast was always going to get over on account of his freakish athletic ability and natural aptitude in the ring, but let's be honest, back in the early days of his run, the Minnesota native wasn't exactly Ric Flair on the mic. And this was exactly why, upon his debut in 2002, he was paired up with a man who could handle that aspect of the job with ease, Paul Heyman. Yes, in the history of wrestling, few people have ever been able to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the former ECW boss on the stick. So with the combination of his mouth and Brock's muscle then, it's no surprise the two went on to become one of the most dominating forces in WWE history. But even when the Beast left the company in 2004 to go start a career in MMA, in fact, he'd make sure that upon his return almost a decade later, his old advocate was back by his side. And this proved to be the start of an arguably even better second run for the pair then, as with Heyman standing in his client's corner when he famously ended The Undertaker's streak at WrestleMania 30, the duo suddenly became unstoppable. Honestly, since that point, Lesnar has pretty much maintained his role as the final boss of WWE, someone anybody who's looking to prove themselves has to go through. Unfortunately though, Brock no longer has his advocate in his corner anymore as of the time of this video's recording because the New York native has since moved on to a different performer entirely as his new meal ticket. Who are we talking about here? Why, Roman Reigns of course. Sure, it's easy to say now that the Tribal Chief was always destined for greatness, but let's be honest. Prior to his heel turn in alignment with Paul Heyman in 2020, he was floundering to put it nicely. And if we were to put it bluntly, he spent almost a decade failing to get over with fans in any meaningful way, with this resulting in a situation where no matter how much Vince McMahon tried to push him as his next top star, it just wasn't happening. So thank God after a brief sabbatical at the turn of the decade then, Roman decided a change was needed in his character going forward, and that the first step towards doing this was to hire the man who'd once took Brock Lesnar to the next level as not only his advocate, but also his wise man. Yes, as the bloodline was beginning to form around him, the head of the table was able to continue building momentum on account of the fact Heyman was always there to whisper in his ear, helping him to ensure he kept his family in line in the process, all while he was continuing to hold the universal title around his waist. And this is a formula which is carried on to the current day, and one which has ultimately worked so well, Reigns is in the midst of a thousand day plus reign as undisputed WWE Universal Champion. Truly then, you could make a solid argument there's no better manager-wrestler pairing in the industry today. In fact, based on his success with two different clients across the decades, you could argue Paul Heyman is the greatest of all time at what he does. That said, there are still those who would argue for another, someone who managed pretty much every heel worth their salt in the 80s. But for all the greats he stood in the corner of, perhaps none were more important to Bobby Heenan than Andre the Giant. Why was this? Well, Andre was unlike anyone else wrestling had ever seen. As with his mammoth size and unholy amounts of charisma, he was a star attraction everywhere he went. It didn't matter which of the territories he was touring that particular month, whenever the Frenchman showed up and audiences got a chance to see him up close and in person, they were always blown away. And so were his opponents as it happened because, given his strength, few ever stood a chance against the Giant. Still though, for as successful as he was during this period, his real height arguably came in 1987, as it was then that, after deciding he deserved a shot at Hulk Hogan's WWF title, the big man formally turned heel by aligning himself with Bobby Heenan, with him using the brain sway to ensure he got the match he wanted. Of course, you all know what happened after that. WrestleMania 3 took place in front of one of the largest crowds in the industry's history. And it was in the main event of the show that Andre and Hogan had their now iconic showdown. But even if the heel didn't win this one, it wouldn't mark the end of his alliance with Heenan. No, the pair continued on as a double act for some time after, in fact, with them even remaining together long enough to dethrone the Hulkster the following year, and then sell the WWF title to the million dollar man Ted DiBiase immediately afterward. 
Sure, they would eventually go their separate ways once Andre turned babyface again in 1989, but by that point, the legacy they'd created together was already secured anyway. In fact, the only manager-wrestler pair who could really compete with what they achieved during this era is our next subject. Who are we talking about this time? Who else but Macho Man Randy Savage and Miss Elizabeth? Now this one is slightly different from any of the other partnerships in today's video, as for a period at least, Randy and Liz were a shoot married couple. That's right, after falling in love with Liz prior to his signing with WWF in 1985, the Macho Man decided he wanted to bring his bride-to-be in with him as his valet during this time in New York. And what a great decision this turned out to be, because with him playing the jealous heel at this point, and with her playing the princess-like put-upon lover who young boys everywhere had a crush on, it created magic every time the two were on screen together. In fact, so great was it, that even when the two had an on-screen split following Randy's loss to Hulk Hogan at WrestleMania V, fans still wanted to see them reunite one day. So it's just as well they eventually got to see just that when at WrestleMania 7 two years later, Elizabeth jumped the ringside barrier to save her man following his bout against the Ultimate Warrior. And with this creating one of the most genuinely feel-good moments in wrestling history, the only logical next step was for them to have a televised wedding, something which took place a few months later at that year's SummerSlam. Sadly though, by the time their run in New York had ended come the mid-90s, the couple would not only have separated on-screen once more, but they'd also have separated off-screen too. Yes, it's a sad thing that many real-life wrestling relationships end in heartbreak, and while this was also the case for two out of the three of our next subjects, at least while they were together in the early 2000s, the Hardy Boys and Lita were still able to make history in their own unique way. How did they do this exactly? Well, by capturing the zeitgeist of the time in such a perfect way, they became undeniable as superstars. Honestly, for an era that was all about extreme sports and TV shows like Jackass, the wild stunts Matt and Jeff pulled off on a weekly basis were exactly what kids watching wanted to see. And it wasn't just them who were pulling off these stunts either as it happened, because once Lita joined the group in 2000, she also put in her fair share of time doing things like leaping off ladders in spectacular fashion, which was exactly why you could argue she was more than just a mere manager to Team Extreme. No, she was a bona fide third member. Maybe that's why Matt Hardy came to fall in love with her then, as by the time their run was over, both he and Lita were a real-life item behind the scenes. And while this would end poorly, it doesn't change the fact that what they did together during that now iconic run is a testament to just how much chemistry they shared with not only one another, but with Jeff Hardy too. After all, what would the Attitude Era have been were it not for their pair of excellent TLC bouts against the Dudley Boys and Edge and Christian? Certainly not as fun to watch, that's for sure. And had Lita not been there to keep the flag of women's wrestling flying in New York during her matches against Trish Stratus and others like her, we probably wouldn't have the kinds of names we have out there today. Names like Mercedes Monet, Charlotte Flair, or Bianca Belair, as they likely would never have been inspired to lace up their own boots in the first place. In terms of influence then, you could easily put Team Extreme up there with any other wrestler-manager pairing that's ever existed. But that doesn't necessarily make them the most iconic. No, for that, you need something truly special, some intangible which forever links the people involved together, the very thing which The Undertaker and Paul Bearer had in spades. Just think for a second how different the dead man's career would have been if his most famous corner man hadn't been there for at least the early part of his run, and instead, Brother Love had taken up the mantle permanently instead. It doesn't really seem right, does it? And that's because never were a pair better made for each other than Mark Calloway and Percy Pringle. Hell, so tailor-made were they, the latter legitimately worked as a funeral director prior to getting into the industry during the mid-70s. So it should come as no surprise that once they started working together in 1991, things immediately went to the next level for The Undertaker, as with his manager by his side, he went on to beat Hulk Hogan for the WWF title just a few months later. And as if that wasn't enough, it would also be at this point that he'd begin his WrestleMania win streak when he pinned Jimmy Snuka at the Showcase of the Immortals in March. Of course, like with so many of the other great duos we've discussed today though, this one was never destined to last forever as in 1994, Bearer turned on his client when he decided he was better off hitching his wagon to mankind instead. But that wouldn't be the end of the pair's association, as despite now being on the opposite ends of the ring from one another, they continue to remain tied up in feuds for years to come. 
with perhaps the most famous example of this happening when the heel manager introduced the Phenom's long-lost brother Kane to WWF audiences a few years later. And once that was over, Taker and Bearer would even have a brief reunion when they joined forces once more during the Ministry of Darkness era. Then, as if that wasn't enough, after he spent a spell playing the American Badass, once Calloway reverted back to his old dead man gimmick just in time for WrestleMania 20, he'd make sure to call upon Pringle to stand in his corner here, too. But that marked their last hurrah in many ways, as soon thereafter, Taker ended their allegiance when he buried his manager in cement in one of the most ludicrous scenes in WWE history. Thankfully though, not all manager wrestling pairings end so dramatically, something we're sure our next subjects, the Honky Tonk Man and Jimmy Hart, are only too happy to hear. And what another perfect pairing this one was, as with both having music-themed gimmicks, it felt like a natural fit for the two to slot together once Wayne Ferris joined WWF in 1986, and from there began his new Elvis impersonator character. Hell, so perfect was it that the Mouth of the South was even able to write the theme song for his client and listen to it with pride each time it played them out to the ring after that. Of course, this wasn't their finest achievement as a duo, though. No, that came on June 13, 1987, when with Hart by his side, Honky pinned Ricky the Dragon Steamboat to become the Intercontinental Champion. And what made such a title win all the more legendary in the long run was that the Tennessee native went on to hold the belt for a full 454 days, a record which stood all the way until 2023, at which point Gunther finally beat it with his own Intercontinental title run. Still, neither the Honky Tonk Man nor Jimmy Hart should feel bad about this, as their legacy as a pairing is still secure on account of all the work they did back then. And that includes their time in the tag division too, as there was also the period where they added a third member to the ranks in the form of Greg the Hammer Valentine when they formed Rhythm and Blues. But even then, it's the two-man unit people will remember most, more specifically the year and change they dominated the New York mid-card scene, as this was when they were simply unbeatable. But had they ever been forced to go up against our next subject, that may not have been the case, because in mid-90s WWF, there were few forces more destructive than Bam Bam Bigelow and Luna Vachon. That's right, take one incredible athletic big man who's quite literally covered head to toe in tattoos, and add the crazed daughter of Butcher Vachon into the mix, and you have a recipe for one of the most intense pairings in wrestling history. So crazy was it, in fact, during the New Generation era in New York, few people were willing to go anywhere near them for fear they'd be destroyed in short order. And this was what led to Bam Bam and his main squeeze quickly building up a reputation for themselves which couldn't be denied. A reputation which even saw the former at one point main event WrestleMania 11 against football star Lawrence Taylor. Sure, Luna wasn't by his side for this match specifically, but she was there in spirit watching him from afar and willing him on to victory anyway. Yes, even after the Atlanta native left the company in 1994, she remained close with her client as by this point, the two had created such a strong bond on screen, it would seem silly for them not to stay in touch. But then what else would you expect from the pair who had a memorable comedy feud against the likes of Doink and Dink leading into WrestleMania 10, or more serious programs which saw them get involved with performers such as Bret, Hitman Hart, or Tatanka at other points? Really, the only thing stopping Bam Bam and Luna from being remembered even more fondly than they are is the time period they existed in. And that's because everybody knows that the new generation was a rough time for the WWF to say the least. But then maybe this makes the legacy they were able to carve out for themselves even more impressive. As if they could stand out so much when the company was at death's door, just imagine what they could have done together had they been around as a unit at the time of something like the Attitude Era instead. That said, any of the people we've discussed today deserve the same level of praise, as they all did something with their time together which won't be forgotten in a hurry.